Achtung, Achtung, welcome to the We Have Ways live stream special with me, Al Murray, and my co-host, of course, James Holland. Uh, tonight, by popular demand, uh, the man keeping much of the Western world informed of the very latest situation in Ukraine, um, nevertheless, felled by a raw prawn last week. It is, of course, <laughs> our very own uh, correspondent, Peter <laughs> Kadik Adams. Uh, welcome, Peter. Um, thanks for being able to join us this week. And, and uh, since we went fortnightly, we had a little we had a little discussion about how we would fit you back into the schedule. And luckily, you were available this week for a one-off. So thanks for joining us. How are you, more importantly? I am very well, and I must have to Roman Abramovich for passing on the lurgy that, that clearly the Chechens <laughs> tried to nab me with last week. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, now, we've got an absolute uh, ton of questions for you to try and, and, and get through over the next hour. Um, but let's start with your latest appraisal of um, what we think, because after all, one of the, the, the fog of war um, decided the minute this all began, what what we think the situation in in Ukraine is by the end of today, but the state of play tonight. Fine. Well, I mean, I, I I want to push back a bit about some of the the um the d interesting and constructive debate we've had um on uh, online yeah. uh, about whether whether and how we should stray out of strictly nineteen thirty nine to forty five. Um, and I would just yeah. nod uh, to everyone. Um. Uh, and you will both know this, uh, that, I mean, I started being a military historian, uh, being tutored by Richard Holmes. And uh, the good Professor Holmes, who, for those who don't know, created the War Walks television series yeah. and wrote 30 books, um, he advised me to start with the Romans and work my way up to the present day. Um, and long yeah. before he became a First or Second World War historian, um, he, he used to be found gallivanting around the countryside with Brigadier Peter Young, who was the founder of the English Sealed Knot. Um, so right. uh, so never mind the Second World War. Um, he was there prancing around in uh, velvet breeches and lace cuffs long before we knew him as, as the uh, the grizzled professor striding over the Somme or walking through um, through Alamein. Um, and, that, and that's the school yeah. where I come from. Uh, and I don't think you can sort of shut off any particular avenues. So... I, I hope you know yeah. everyone is is here in the in that spirit. And those who choose not to, that's that's absolutely fine. But I think that's yeah. really the context I want to bring to tonight, and and you know why we're, therefore we should slide forward to uh, to talk about Ukraine uh, in 2022 because um, Putin himself has set the agenda. He's talked about history. We would call it fake history. It's it runs counter to yeah. everything we know, everything we've ever discussed on on these podcasts and elsewhere. Um, but he's the man who's saying this is all about history. Uh, so that's you know that's where I, I start from. Um, so we are just over a month into the campaign. This was a campaign that was going to last for three days. Uh, Putin had uh, told told all his oligarchs beforehand it would be a three or four day campaign. Um, he had budgeted for 30 days. So he's now in panic mode with his accountants because this is not, not something the Russian Federation had ever conceived. Uh, and there's no easy yeah. way out. Um, so Vladimir at the moment in, is in his hollowed out volcano with a, gra with a glass roof, um, yeah. wondering what his options are. <laughs> Um, and the longer he wonders, um, the worse it's going to be for him. Um, so the, the other overall thing I would dive into before we, we, we get immersed in the details is um, we've all studied the Second World War from afar. Very few of us were you know, part of it. Some of, some of our viewers and yeah. listeners will, will, may have been through it, but the rest of us have had the benefit of scholarship and hindsight. And I reckon it takes about 10 or 20 years before most of, of, of the salient details come out and, and we've poured over everything and analysed it. And what we're doing with this war yep. is we're looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but because we're used to looking back at Arnhem or D-Day or whatever it is, yep. we're used to those big sweeping conclusions, whether it's about lo logistics, whether it's about what's going on inside Putin's head that we can't possibly know. And we're speculating yeah. and we're being asked to speculate uh, about stuff that really we won't have any sure firm visibility about for at least 10 years. 
Um, and that's the trouble. Yeah. So we're all diving in um, and we're picking stuff up and you know, uh, interpreting it, 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 it far too quickly and far too soon. Um, and the other thing is, of course, we are all responding to the, the war in Ukraine through social media, largely through social media, um, or the news channels yeah. that we watch or the newspapers we buy. Um, and that is self-selecting. So we, we know almost yeah. nothing about the Russian side. What we're getting about the Russian side comes from the Ukrainians, uh, and they have a vested interest in giving us their version of the truth. Um, what we know about the Ukrainian side is, again, from them. And there's very little that's coming out that's that's impartial. The the UK and Defence Intelligence Service give us a, a daily update, which, bless their cotton socks, is worse than useless because it doesn't tell us anything, because it doesn't give any military secrets away. So you throw that into the right. mix. And what we're doing is we're giving ourselves the picture we want of plucky little Ukraine uh, beating the Russians hands down. Um, and we're reinforcing that message every time. Um, and when someone, you know, on my Twitter feed or so elsewhere on social media comes in with a really aggressive anti-Ukrainian, I block them. But that's just, you know, that's just focusing me even more in my little tunnel of the pro-Ukraine war. Uh, so I'm the first to say that, you know, I'm lacking objectivity here. Um, and when I go off piece and speculate and try and work out what's happening, it's it's on the basis of almost no knowledge at all. And I've, I find that really yeah. difficult because, you know, we've all been in this sort of situation of looking at war from afar. However, I think why I'm qualified is that in um, the 1990s, I spent uh, uh, 1996, 97 in the I4S4 headquarters in Bosnia and Sarajevo, reacting to things on a day-to-day -day basis. So you could, you could, you, you know, I was in a privileged position there. So I was aware of some of the undercurrents. And then again, in the the first Gulf, uh, in the second Gulf War, um, which is whenever it was, nearly 20 years ago, 19 years ago, as we speak, I was there having to sort of make sense of things on an hourly basis. But I knew what the big plan was. So I think, yeah. you know, my final takeaway before we dive into details is um, Ukraine has done incredibly well. But if Russia wants to continue, they have an endless supply of manpower and of kit with which they can grind the Ukrainians right down. Um, and if this war goes on for years and years, the pendulum will swing in Russia's favor, however little we want that to happen and however many... Yeah. missiles and air defense rockets we send into ukraine it won't make up for manpower um and they're busy training volunteers and reservists all the time um and it, at the moment it's a race of, of who can get as many reinforcements into the country uh, as possible um but, but there is numbers i have to say are on the russian side and i'm not being anti-ukrainian here i'm just being sort of realistic and this is where our studies of the Second World War would come in, the Great Patriotic War. But, um, but however, then that also... A German with your MG42, um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, 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 as a Russian once said to Eisenhower in the run-up to D-Day, when he was asked about his tactics on the Eastern Front, he just said, well, you know, we send in the manpower, um, we wait till the Germans have used up all their ammunition shooting our guys, and then we charge with wh whoever's left. And there's a bit of yeah. You know, I mean, the thing the thing the, is that the, the, the well, the constraint on that though for the Russians is their economy being sanctioned, isn't it? And uh, uh, and so because if it, it, it you know in the long run Russia could dominate, but if their economy meanwhile um, uh, falls in on itself, it, they might not be able to. And also, the R Russian population is shrinking, as I understand it, in a way that in a way that in the old days. You know, it was families with eight kids, and now it isn't anymore. It's much more like a European two two child family or one child family. So that there isn't any more the vast resource of um, uh, uh, young men that you can pump in pump into an army. I mean, there's they're still a, it's still a much bigger population, but they're they're not quite they're not they haven't quite got 
those things at their disposal anymore, have they? Um, no, and I mean, there's a very good argument that their demographics are in dire order because their life expectancy is so yeah. incredibly low as well. I mean, we are, you know, we would expect to yeah. um, uh, at least to run until our sort of late 70s or 80s. Um, most Russians yeah. are lucky if they get past 60. Um, you know, and and yeah. that's the that's the, well, the tobacco the, uh, the life expectancy has fuel fallen. lifestyle they live. The, the, Peter, yeah, yeah. The, the, the life expectancy has fallen below sixty for the first time since the nineteen forties. God, unbelievable. Yeah, so that's I mean, it's so, interesting. so they're, 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 they're having far fewer years. kids. Yeah, go on. Well, I you know I think I think the other just to go back to your sort of general point of you know why are we why are we spending time as in my case, a Second World War hist historian, kind of even daring to comment on the current current conflict, and I think it's really interesting. If you think about the kind of um, the weather forecasters before D Day, you had two different camps. You had those who who believed purely in the science of what they could see right here, right now, and that was this their Peterson approach, which was the British approach, um, supported ultimately by Stag, and then you had the American approach, which was um, you know, Dr. Irving Crick, who preferred a more analog approach, which was looking at earlier weather patterns to try and make sense of what was happening in the present. And I think there is an analog approach to Ukraine that one can look at through one's earlier knowledge of the terrain, through what we know happened in the past, through looking at weather conditions in that part of the world, looking at the geography of that part of the world, the rivers, the open plains, the vast of it, the the comparative, the infrastructure and comparative lack of infrastructure in the hinterland of, of Ukraine. Um, by also by looking at what the Russians are doing and what we can what we can tell by what they're not doing, um, which I think is interesting. And I think you can start to sort of piece together um, um, certain sort of parallels and patterns of of behavior and patterns of warfare which i think are incredibly relevant i mean you know one of one of hitler's great problems in the second world war was that he surrounded himself by yes men he was completely totally autocratic in a way that the general secretary of of the communist party after stalin was not you know khrushchev was overturned of course and, and thrown out um putin is much more in that complete totalitarian autocratic um situation he wants to be told what he wants to hear and if you're telling something to putin you have a choice don't you you either say exactly what he wants to hear and hope it all works out or you tell him what he doesn't want to hear and and take the consequences mm -hmm. and you know it's clear that you know he lies all the time and it's clear that everyone's been lying all the time you can look at what they've been doing and realize that they've got a, a very dodgy logistical base you can you can hear from the experience of those who have come up against Russian troops, and yes, okay, it's um, it, it, it's it's from a Ukrainian bent, but you know we've all read that piece by that American today who was talking to an American front ex Marine who's served on wow. the front line, and his observations of what he's seen of the um, Soviet, um, not Soviet, the Russian Russian attacks and all the rest of it, Russian tactics, and all of that helps us to have far from complete, but but. <clears throat> some information from which to kind of start to piece together what on earth is going on and it's not entirely blind that's the point you know and for lots of people who know nothing about military history who know nothing about how armies are organized or air forces are organized or about tactics or logistics or supply or the issues of war having an expert in that field make his or her assessment of what is going on i think is useful for those who know diddly squat yeah well i certainly don't feel out of a job and i certainly feel that i'm making a uh, a valid comparison uh, comparison i mean what we're doing is we're we're attempting to write a narrative based on what we know has happened in the past um and of yeah. course the planners on both sides have put together their plans based on what has happened before and, and their capabilities. So they're working in exactly the same sort of way. So what we're doing is very valid uh, and very helpful. I was just making the point that there's there's um, there's an awful lot that we don't know. Um, I mean, it's, it's Donald Rumsfeld's yeah, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, but there's quite a lot of that going on. I mean, we would have said that 
Russia to, to launch any kind of offensive like this before, the first thing they would do would be a massive cyber attack. Um, and that largely hasn't happened. But I'll correct that. It has happened, and it is happening, but we haven't felt the effects. And what's happened is, is the Russians have been nibbling away at Ukraine's cyber defences ever since they went into the Crimea and even before, and that's eight years ago. So that's been a war that Ukraine's been fighting and, and is blooded and actually quite well proofed. So by the time the real war happens, 2022, they're quite resilient and they know what they're doing. Uh, and Russia's uh, yeah. cyber efforts aren't nearly so dangerous. But there is a massive cyber war that's happening all around us every second. There's something like 300,000 cyber warriors, hackers that were, I mean, they, you know, they may be spotty 16 year olds who are members of Anonymous or, or they may work at, at you know, government cyber centers. Um, but there's an awful lot of people involved in a war that is completely invisible to us. Uh, and we won't know yeah. about it for another perhaps 10 years because we don't know how long this will work, uh, go on for. Um, and, and all the lessons that come out of it will be valuable for fighting an, a, a cyber war in the future. So there's a, there's a big chunk of invisibility about, um, you know, and, and satellites being jammed. I mean, we haven't got, got into satellite wars yet, but <coughs> that's just around the corner. So there's also got some fascinating aspects that, that you know, we have to park at the moment. And what we do need to do is, is, is draw the comparisons with the war that we know and we feel comfortable with um, that's been fought over that terrain before, and, and not just the First World War, Second World War, but the first as well. I mean, some of you know Prit Buttar, who from, um, from his uh, wonderful books on the Eastern Front, um, and he straight away realised he couldn't write on the Second World War in isolation without nodding to the same kind of conflicts fought by the same commanders when they were junior officers over the same terrain only 20 years earlier. So there's that linkage there straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah. And well, you know, also, I, I've walked around been... around anyway. Peter, I've also been talking to um, our, our, our great friend, Alex Ritchie. And, oh, yeah. You know, Alex is having... Oh, yeah. Alex and... Um, you know, obviously she's in Poland, she's in Warsaw, and, you know, she's got a bag packed ready to go, should it come to it. Um, you know, she's, I, I was saying that, you know, surely he's not going to go nuclear and all this kind of stuff. And she's saying, well, it, you know, probably not, but it feels very different if you're in Poland. And, you know, there's history there with, with Russia. Yeah. And he said that puts a completely different slant on things. So there again, you've got history coming into play with how extra twitchy the poles are. And, and well, might they be? You know, they're bordering, you know, Russia and, and, and Belarus. Well, uh, I mean, there's, there's an interesting that. context to that straight away. Um, over the weekend, a retired three star Polish lieutenant general, former commander in chief of Polish ground forces, uh, who, who is a bit of a self publicist, but nevertheless went on Polish state television. And said, OK, well, two can play at that game. If Russia wants to talk about rearranging borders on one side of our country, let's talk about Kaliningrad. Um, and, oh uh, you know, Germans <laughs> renounce all claims to Kaliningrad. Um, therefore, it can only be Polish. Therefore, what we need to do is lay some plans and talk about rearranging those borders, because as a Russian enclave, it makes no sense anymore and is, in fact, a huge threat so, Mr. Putin, if you've got plans, um, perhaps it's about time we started taking the gloves off uh, and uh, throwing the same kind of rhetoric back at you. And I mean, he's that that has just sort of thrown all sorts of things up into the air. But it, you know, underlines the, the Polish history, um, uh, and it it, it underlines. You know, up until now, you know, we've all been very very tense about Russia, and we've been biting our tongues for all sorts of very sensible diplomatic reasons and now there's this explosion of hate which isn't just yeah. a reaction to the moment it's a lot of people saying told you so you didn't believe us yeah this is yeah what they were and they you know they've been planning this for a long time and in some cases they have so there's you know the, there's there's that and it's not just the poles it's the czechs it's the slovaks i mean i would i really wouldn't want to be living in one of the three baltic countries at the moment I mean, they're lovely. They are lovely. 
and I, I, I've been to them all. But 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 if you are Estonian and living sixty miles from St Petersburg, or no, one hundred and twenty miles from St Petersburg, which is is where the border is, you know, you ha you look at this in a completely different way. Um, and well, yeah. you know, that's for very us, much, that's very much Alex's point. That's very much Alex's point. Yeah, and. Yeah. Um, I mean, she was saying, you know, she'd love to come on and talk about, about the refugees and comparisons of the refugee crisis of, of the Second World War and the end of the Second World War of what is happening now, which I thought would be absolutely fascinating. But, but mm. you know, I mean, I mean, people have been talking about the threat to the Baltic states for, for years, haven't they? And, and no one's believed it. Um, but the thing is, the thing is, I mean, if you know, if you do take a long view, then this is another episode in the sort of the, the endless sort of, our, you know, push me pull you that goes on in you know and this sounds terribly far away country of which i know little um you know, the endless push me pull you that goes on in this part of the world where empires or conglomerates rise and fall and shove each other aside and collapse in onto themselves and the you know russians are looking for buffer states or the germans are looking for colonies east and you know and, and, and this is another episode in that as much as it's a a, a, it's absolutely modern war that's happening right now. If you look at it in the in that grand sweep, it's sort of another installment in this sort of relentless saga of of um, you know uh, uh, power politics and dislocation and and nations jostling for jostling for a primacy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean that's a very good point. I mean Tim Snyder has written a very good book called Bloodland. Yeah. which came out you know quite a, a long time ago but but the phrase just sums up that whole sort of region um and one of the problems yeah. is there are no natural frontiers um there are for an awful i mean so, you know we we take it for granted you know we're, we we've got our own moat the germans have got their western moat of the Rhine. a lot of countries have got some kind of geological feature like a mountain range yeah. or a river that that sort of parcels land up um, and in the east, you know, that, that sort of eastern area, they're just not available. There's a few, few rivers up and down which trade move, the Dnieper, for example. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's that's one of the problems. So we've got sort of endless sort of shifting influences. Um, and sometimes it's the church. Sometimes it's, you know, Mongol invaders. Sometimes it's Viking traders. Um, you know, more latterly, yeah. it, it, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's technological armies. But it's not right to follow the the Putin view that each and every time the threat has come from the West, it hasn't. Sometimes yeah. it's come from the North. It's yeah. been Peter. Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. True. Peter, I mean, you, you said earlier on that you felt, you know, if it does become long and attritional and all the rest of it, then, you know, Russia will grind down Ukraine. I'm just not sure about that. I mean, you know, Russia is already tanking money. It can't afford it. It's... it's it, you know, its, it's the economy is going into free fall. I mean, obviously, so is so is Ukraine, but Ukraine's got lots of friends, and Russia hasn't got that many friends. It's got China, but China's sort of playing it quite cool at the moment. I mean, in a long traditional war, I mean, the, surely at some point, someone in the FSB or a group in the FSB or a group of oligarchs are going to go, I've had enough of this, thank you very much. And either topple him or... or I don't know. I, I I can't see how Russia can keep going indefinitely because, you know, traditionally they haven't kept going indefinitely. They didn't get keep going indefinitely in Afghanistan. They retreated, um, uh, and you know they've already tanked more people than they did in Afghan. And I don't know. I, I you know, they they're going backwards. And and yes, they might get, you know, the Donbass region, I suppose. But but much more than that seems to me a bit fanciful right at the moment. I mean, you know, and, and, what, and what's no, the point I mean, of sending thermobaric weapons and hypersonic weapons onto a country that you're never going to be able to govern just to destroy it? I mean, what's the point? You know, all these... Well, I mean, you're, crazy, you're absolutely right, but, but I, I don't point know, one is... anything like the arsenal of weapons that they say they have. Well, I think point point one is, is you know, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, um, but point two is um, we have to, we have to um, prepare for that eventuality that it, it might cool. just go on for for a long time. Um, but I think far far more validly, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it, it's unlikely to. But both sides have threatened this. So um, Zelensky mm. 
has threatened a great big attritional war in his cities. He's threatened Stalingrad in Kiev and Kharkiv, and our, our focus was on that for the first three weeks. And, and I sort of missed a trick that, that actually the urban warfare, the Stalingrad, was being fought out in poor old Mariupol, um, yeah. which is you know that that's just about to culminate and and there's you know all, there's almost no way of saving it which is a great shame um but it it underlines two points one one is that the the ukrainians will fight to the last round and the last brick uh, and secondly that the russians don't have the combat power to do mariupol again anywhere else it just sucks in manpower and just also slows them right down um and that's the threat so and and, and then the other threat that the Ukrainians can pull out, out of their historical hat is partisan warfare. Um, mm. And, you know, that was what was so good against the Germans in the Second World War. Um, and don't think that in the last five years that the Brits, Canadians and Americans who've been training the professional Ukrainian army haven't thought about this and haven't given mm. them a steer on partisan warfare, hides, how to blow up railway lines, how to work out where headquarters are. Um, and some of this is paying off. I mean, at the moment, the count, I think, is seven Russian generals who've been killed in the field, senior Russian generals. Um, that's that's to miss the point that, that Russian colonels are often equally important. And so are staff officers yeah. in headquarters. Uh, and these are guys who wandered into the line of fire they haven't been picked off by the odd sniper they haven't been felled by an unlucky mortar mortar round they've been targeted by ukrainian special forces who've been taught where to look and how to look by western armies and that's why there's a huge toll of ukraine of russian generals who've been killed and that will go on um so in I a mean, way that's that's already part of the partisan war this is what you know chats andy chats um, and, and, you know, the, the auxiliaries in Britain in 1940 were preparing for. And all of these targets, all of these uh, tactics have, uh, have suddenly come to life in 2022. Another echo from the past. Yeah, I mean, but Peter, I mean, uh, I, I mean, actually, the thing the thing I've been sort of um, thinking about seeing from as far as I can tell from the way that, that the Ukrainians conducted the war is this is a direct link to Second World War. And in fact, Second World War historiography, because quite clearly, you have a devolved mission command style of doing things going on with the Ukrainians where people know what to do they, and they're getting on with it. And there isn't a there isn't a it doesn't look like there's a particularly top down, you know, um, uh, uh, the fails tactic uh, system that the Russians obviously seem to operate on, that the officers is issue the orders and then they, they try and they try and carry them out. And if they don't, they try them again. And then they try them again, which is what's been going on at Hostomel and places like that. Is that it? Look, and after all, mission command is the idealized version of Alf Tug's tactique, which is the the great lesson the British and the Americans learned from the Second World War that the that the Germans have been using this incredible way of defending themselves against superior odds. That then get sort of because after all, what no one wants to do in the fifties is say, "Wow, the reason the." the reason the Germans are fighting to the last round is because they're actually extremely well mobilized by National Socialism and their National Socialist government. Let's find another explanation. And the other explanation is Alftag's tactique, which, of course, is a, oh. a, a, a Prussian ideal that works its way through into the 30s. But by the time you get to the big battles that people talk about in on the Eastern Front and in Normandy, all those people have all been chewed up by by the war. And and Alftag tactique necessarily doesn't necessarily you know, is, is an idea, but the extent to which people are trained in it and so on. But in NATO, it becomes this idealized mission command thing that now it just looks like that's what's going on. That, you know, that you've got chaps with self-organized chaps with anti-tank weapons and that's their job is to go and find them. And and, and they know they know this. And that, that that's what that looks like. And that seems to me, if you want, if you want, if you want to say, well, why if on a second world war podcast, would you be talking about this? Well, there's your absolute direct. Yeah, absolutely. And 100% thread back. I've got a couple yeah. of other points there. First of all, and this is one that, that Peter, you told me years ago when we were comparing 1940 with 1944 in the Ardennes. And you said, well, just look at Sam Vitt, you know, just look at Bastogne. What the Americans were able to do that the French couldn't do was hold the nodal points. 
which of course is exactly what the Ukrainians are doing. The rivers, the cities, yeah, the crossing yeah. points, the key moments there. You know, the Russians get onto an airfield, but the, the Ukrainians then blow up 30 helicopters. So the, you, the Russians come back again with more trucks and helicopters and the Ukrainians blow them up again. You know, the, the Russians are not able to hold on to those nodal points. And, and the Ukrainians absolutely are. And it also, you know, what the Russians are doing reminds me so much of, of the French army in 1940. This very top heavy, which stifles initiative, um, lack of morale, which also stifles initiative. Whereas in contrast, you know, morale, morale is pretty good um, and you've got motivation. And when you've got motivation, you're always prepared to use your initiative in a way that you're not if you're unmotivated. And you'll say you're seeing, again, these patterns of war that we keep talking about. You're seeing them repeated in this current situation. And OK, we're only responding to what we've seen. But when you see a long column of Russian um, uh, um, vehicles all parked up and going absolutely nowhere, I think you can draw pretty accurate conclusions of what's gone wrong there. You know, and it's a combination of morale. It's a combination of poor logistics. It's a, it's a, it's a combination of underestimating, underestimating your enemy, underestimating your own capabilities, all of those in Rome, because otherwise it makes no sense. And if you're trying to make sense of what is going on, it's usually the most likely solution to that to that question is the correct answer, because that's the only one that does make sense. Yeah. Should we take some questions, chaps? Up, yeah. Should we do yeah, that? On, let's do that. But yeah, fit. Yeah, let's take some questions because um, after all, we, we we asked for them. We've got them. Um, and uh, no one wants to know what I think about what's going on. So um, oh, <laughs> um, let's, we have a question from Liam, I believe. Um, uh, what lessons? Um, Liam, Liam, Liam asks and, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of where we just actually where we just got to. What lessons have Russia learned from the Second World War? And what mistakes are, are they continuing to make? OK, well, the first point to make is that the Ukrainians and the Russians fought on the same side in the same army in the Second World War. Um, and so when Russia went into Ukraine on the 24th of February, they thought effectively they were fighting themselves. They were fighting yeah. the same army with the same doctrine, the same equipment, and therefore they knew what their opponent was going to do. And what happened in 2014 was um, after the Crimea was taken away and the Donbass campaign started, the West started to retrain the Ukrainian army exactly into what you were just talking about in terms of Alftrag's tactic, um, yep. mission command, and basically young officers and NCOs using their initiative. And so now the two armies are different. So what lessons um, do the Russians pick up from the Second World War? What mistakes are they making? The Russian army... Um, hasn't changed from the Second World War, and the Ukrainian army has, and, and in one very specific way, and we hinted at it earlier, which is that the Russians don't really have an NCO corps. They don't really have NCOs. They promote or almost elect people who are sort of senior soldiers, um, but really their junior officers do the job of both an NCO and an officer. And that's why the whole thing falls down, because they initiative is discouraged and the ukrainians pick this up very very quickly so they're functioning like a modern army um but the russians aren't and those are the mistakes they're making and that's direct continuity <coughs> to the second world war um uh, and the, because they're thinking in the same way they're using the same kind of heavy metal mass um, what are they? What are what, what other things can we trace back to the Second World War? I mean, the phrase "the Red God of War" is is specifically used for the the Red Army's artillery, uh, and you know that 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 would be not only um, guns, but their Katyusha rockets, the small rockets they were using at the end of the war, uh, and they would just stand off and welly their opponents. And you see this when they're attacking across the River Oda uh, on their way to taking Berlin masses and masses of artillery um far more than than um the uh, the western allies could ever dream of putting into place and we've seen that again in and around Kherson, in, in and around kharkiv in and around um uh, kiev but the trouble is they haven't managed to deploy them because lots of artillery means lots of trucks uh, and uh, and lots of trucks means uh you know that's that's how the ammunition comes up and we, we all know what's gone wrong there um, and old, you know, Philip O'Brien up in um, University of St Andrews has had some very interesting mm. threads on social media. One of which 
um, really astounded me, which is the Russians don't use wooden pallets um, and they don't use containers in the way that we know because they, they're a completely con or largely conscript army. So they've got lots of people hanging around in peacetime who just break stuff down and chuck it in the back of a vehicle. Whereas most Western armies now not only have specialized military pallets, they've also got cranes on every third truck that lift these things around. And so that not only takes the weight, they, the weight off manpower, but it speeds the whole process up. So the Russians are still yeah. locked in about 1970. Um, and they're using some of the tactics that really work for them in, in, in the Second World War. They would work today if they if if their soldiers were functioning in the way that their opponents are um and i mean they've got the kit it, it it's the way that they're using it rather than um any faults with the kit in the first place so there's a mixed bag some of the things that the, the russians are following from the second world war and the ideas are right but it's just it's just the their, their main problem is is manpower and training because they're mostly a conscript army uh, and they just don't have the benefit of that intermediate level. I mean, the, the, the NCOs, we would say in the British army, the American army are, are the backbone and, and in modern corporate speak, that's the corporate memory. That's these, are the guys who teach young soldiers, recruits, whoever you are, how to survive in the field. Always pack a couple of pairs of socks and you know, change your socks every, all of that stuff. That, that should be written down in manuals, but nobody ever reads. Um, and, you know, all of that wisdom comes from NCOs. And that's just not being passed on to these poor young recruits in the in, in the Russian armed forces. But Peter, we have another question? Uh, uh, can I go on? Well, well, no, I just wanted to follow on what you were saying. It's, I mean, it's one of the things that's happening here. You know, and, and you, you see this so often in, uh, again, in the Second World War, you look at the start of Operation Barbarossa, what you have is one side is is at least half organised, the other side isn't. And in the instance of Barbarossa, it's the Germans have kind of got their act together, although James and I have been talking the last couple of weeks about how maybe it's not quite as gleaming as it appears. But the fact is, the Soviets at that point just cannot tie their own bootlaces, certainly not in the, the forward areas where the German attack first goes in. So when you've got, when you've, the, the mismatch may not necessarily be kit and uh, and whatever. It's if one side's organized and the other side isn't. The Ukrainians seem to be organized. The, the Russians don't seem to be in the way that as James says in 1914 France, the Germans are organized, the French aren't really, they're not mobilized. That, that, that can be the difference, certainly in the opening stages yeah, of things, yeah, sort of things as much as anything else. Yeah, I mean, and I think, think following on from that, right. Go on, go on, James. Go on, Jim. All right, we've got a little bit of a time lag, which is why we keep interrupting each other. I'm sorry. Um, but but I, I caught up with, with Phil O'Brien the week before last up in St Andrews, and it was it was great to see him, and it was great to kind of grill him on all this stuff. And he's he's he is absolutely fascinating. He thinks it is literally all down to you know poor logistics and, and obviously sort of lack of pallets is 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 one thing. Um but he it's you know, his interpretation of what he is seeing on film footage and what he's reading in defence journals and what he's gleaming from, you know, presumably pretty much the same sources that you are, Peter, um, which is a kind of uh, a, a greater access to, to kind of sort of military think tanks than your average punter. Um, he thinks it's literally all down to logistics and, ju and just that, the you know, and he's talking in terms of, you know, once you get to kind of 25, 30 percent combat wastage, you're you're really in the doo-doo. And of and of course, the point we've been, you know, Alan and I were making when we were talking about this the other day was that that you might have 190,000 men siphoned off for the Ukraine invasion, but 190,000 men is not 190,000 fighting men. And obviously the casualties are to your fighting bit. And and, mm -hmm. and so the nature of attrition is kind of really interesting. And, you know, no one knows for sure how many casualties the Russians have, have taken. But what we do know, I think, is, is that the Ukrainians have got, have got more holes that they can fill than the Russians, or readily so, anyway. Yeah. I should mean, this, take, this, is where alarm bells ring. this is where alarm bells ring in the back of my mind, because um, 
we just don't have enough clarity about the, the Russians. And logistics is a big chunk, but it's not the, it, it, it's not the only one. Um, both sides have, have reached a pause now, and the Russians are reinforcing with manpower. Now, it may not be very good, um, but some of it will be. Um, you know, they've, they've cycled a lot of people through combat in a lot of places over the years. Um, and I'm not ready to sort of write them down to that extent. Um, and the, the essential point yeah. is that if you go into combat, take France in 1940, um, you may have a rude shock for three or four weeks. But after that, you learn. You learn as an institution. And OK, Russia, the Russian army may not be set up to learn. But uh, you would have thought by this stage, they would start to be aware of their own failings and the reasons why. They would start to start to put measures in place to learn from their mistakes. And, and I mean, their, their problem is probably old Vladimir in his bunker is piling on the pressure to deliver results. But further down the food chain, you're still trying to do the best you can and, and implement reforms and, and everything that you need. Um, I mean, the Russian army may be may have started off appallingly, but after a month, I mean, it isn't a great dinosaur that won't learn at all. Um, and the longer this goes on, the more it's going to learn. And then the pendulum will swing because the, the, it, 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 the onus is on the Russians to pick up all the lessons of, of, of modern war that the ukrainians have already learned that's where i'm going with this yeah yeah go go on let's have another okay. question then. let's go on another question um this is from ryan diamond um uh the campaign in ukraine has seen pundits question the role of unit types we've taken for granted since the second world war e.g tanks and paratroopers has what's happened in ukraine really undermined long valued unit types or has it just highlighted that generals still make the same mistakes well, that's a very good question. And the, the problem is we're looking at this from the Russian point of view. So their paratroopers are, you know, completely crap. Um, uh, and the, the air, their airborne operations in the first few days is came. I mean, that's the first time you've ever heard me use a four letter word, but it just shows you how disillusioned I am with the, some of the Russian armed forces. Um, and large numbers of tanks are being captured because they're being poorly used. Um, but that's only one side of the coin. So the Ukrainians have, have got you know a lot of the same kit. Um, so just because the Russians misuse uh, tanks or airborne forces, it doesn't mean that their days are numbered because we've got to look at how the Ukrainians are using theirs in the same campaign. And the Ukrainians aren't telling us. We're getting very, very doctored accounts of what's going on. I mean, there are, there are plenty of Western people on the ground uh, who are watching what's going on and sending back um, uh, sit reps, situation reports. Um, but even they are, are not having access to all the Ukrainian secrets and, uh, 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 and tactics. And they're being very, um, they're being very circumspect, circumspect in what they're sending back or what they're allowed to send back. Um, mm. So there's, 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 there's not a lot of granularity on, on either side. And if we say, you know, Russian airborne forces have got it wrong uh, and their use of tanks may well indicate the end of the tank. Well, if you look at the way the Ukrainians have been using their, their armor, their infantry fighting vehicles and their armored tank and their tank, their main battle tanks, they've been doing rather well with them. Um, so it depends, you know, from which point of view you look at this. Um, and yeah. I would go back to France in 1940, which, which you know, we've already brought up. Um, it's not a numbers game. It's, it's the doctrine. Uh, and let's remember that um, the French campaign was, was uh, what was it, Fall, uh, Fall Gelb and, and then Fall Rot. Yeah. So the first half, the first three weeks, four weeks was Case Yellow. Um, and the French are absolutely walloped. Um, uh, and everything pauses along the line of the Somme. Uh, well, Dunkirk happens, and then the second campaign opens, yeah. for, uh, and um, the French, the, the German casualty rate in June 1940 is double what it was in May per day, because the yeah. French are already learning and fighting back. And had it yeah. not been for Petain pulling them 
Punk and suing for an armistice, then the, fr the feeling is the French may well have fought the Germans to a standstill within two months. And, and it's that kind of learning curve that's going on in Ukraine today. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is, you know, airborne operations, if you don't have complete total air supremacy, are, 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 a, are a tricky business. And anyway, now that there are man pads absolutely everywhere, is there any such thing as total air supremacy anymore? Because, because you know, stingers and the like are, are such fantastically effective man portable weapons. Is it is it even possible? Is it advisable to fly in a, fly in a whole bunch of helicopters um, to, to somewhere obvious like an airfield? Is it, you know, it, it, is such a thing even feasible in 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 the in, in the you know modern age of uh, man pads? You know. Well, I, don't Johnny forget, there's, says, there's a huge amount of ego and in. And uh, there's a huge amount of ego involved in the, the, the airborne fraternity right across the world. Um, uh, and oh, yeah. there's a, been a lot of investment in their institution and their reputation. Um, and, you know, we can talk we can talk market garden till the cows come home. Um, perhaps mm. we should be talking Crete, which was the, the turning point yeah. for airborne forces. I mean, it, it killed the German airborne forces. Um and they were never used in their proper role ever after. Um, but that's what triggered, really, the growth of British airborne forces. Um, and, uh, and, and landing, uh, and, and the, you know, the Russian airborne forces had their Crete moment. But it's how you interpret that. Um, did they do badly, or were the Ukrainians just particularly lucky? Or did they anticipate yeah. exactly what the Russians would do and put all the countermeasures in place? So it, it, it's not, you know, we don't know enough to say the Russians are really awful because they got it wrong 100%. Because the flip side of that is, well, you know, the Ukrainians were, were very, very clever. Um, and what you need is a, a, you know, a meeting of the two. So I don't see any reason to say at the moment that the days of airborne forces are, are numbered. They're very vulnerable. And the point you make about man pads and stingers is absolutely right. But that's been the case in a wider sense. I mean, you no one wants to fly in daylight over yeah. Ukraine at the moment. Um, but we've we've lost sight of the fact that, you know, that's really the case. Uh, that, that would be the case in Syria if the rebel forces on the ground had an adequate supply of air defense. And they don't. But even then, they get yeah. lucky every now and yeah. again and shoot something down. So I think, you know, the, yeah. the days of that one phrase, air supremacy are long gone um and i think they've been long gone since afghanistan um and those will never come back uh, but there's, there's there's nothing to indicate that airborne forces have uh the, the, the days of airborne forces are numbered coming out of what we've seen so far in um uh, in, in ukraine particularly with the sort of um, the airports uh and the seizures of air bases and airports yeah. There's been some great comments on the sidebar of shame. Um, uh, and I like John York's question, which is, will the new John Deere come with a dedicated tank <laughs> attachment? <laughs> well, that, I mean, that, now that's another interesting point about, about the way this campaign is going, <laughs> because we've, we've had great fun uh, at the Russians' expense about tractors pulling uh, Russian armoured vehicles away. And, and, and this is what happens. This is a symptom of sort of day-to-day -day, uh, combat reporting. Um, we get hooked up on all sorts of ideas that then make the headlines. So one, you know, the, the lighthearted one is towing the tractors away. We had um, we had drones being taken out by jars of pickles or jars of tomatoes. Um, uh, but I mean, more seriously, we've got hung. We, we first of all, we got hung up on the swift banking system. Was that a good idea to? Um, cut Russia out of that. Um, a lot of debate, and eventually it happened. The no-fly zone is still sort of um, buzzing around, as it were, as an idea, as a concept. Should it happen or shouldn't it? Uh, and this is what happens with these uh, with with warfare reporting on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, the battles pass us by, but these ideas, when they're not enacted, suddenly become debates, uh, and we all have a, a a view, and that's what characterizes our understanding of the war because we don't really understand anything else that's going on. So the, you know, the ability of, of uh, Ukrainians to, to remove Russian armor by tractor is, is great. I mean, what the, the parallel there 
would be the First World War and the iron harvest because the, the, mm, the yeah. uh, land in France and Belgium was so horribly fought over for such a long period of time. There was no agricultural land that you could use um, after 1918. But what you could do as a farmer was, was, was collect all the rusty metal on your land and you could sell it to the government. Uh, and you've got so many francs um, for a kilo or a ton. And it, it, it's exactly the well, same Peter, as, as retrieving damaged tanks in Normandy. But, but, but Peter, the, the, I think the, the brilliance of the tractor towing the AFE is, is, or the tank or whatever, is that it, it shows a kind of um, a, a David against Goliath kind of resilience. It shows phlegmatism. It shows a sense of humour, which we all like. And as a piece of PR, it's pretty much unrivaled so far in this war, isn't it? I mean, it, it's, you know, every, everyone just loves it. And also it came on the back of, you know, that that famous novel, the something about Ukrainian tractors. You know, yeah. so there was yeah. this sort of ongoing link and it's a sort of nod to the breadbasket of Europe. I mean, I mean, that one single moment of, of tractors towing away image of, of, of tractors towing away air fees says so many different things that yeah. I, I and, and i think we in the west have all kind of just sort of gone as well you see what's interesting is it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy so it was one clip that came out by accident that we all leapt on and then ukrainian farmers themselves have been taking images of them hooking tractors up to russian armor in their farmyards so the whole thing has become a bandwagon it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy but the original clip told us what we was, gave us what we wanted to see. Um, I mean, the real, the, I mean, the war that this is closest to is is the Russo-Finnish War of 1939 to 40, um, and the whole world was backing plucky little Finland in the way that we are backing plucky Ukraine. It's not little, but but we're backing them because we didn't expect them to do so well, um, and that that's the that's the well, real. And because they're a democracy and they're they're pro-West. Well, I, I, that's, a, that's a whole other issue that I, I want to come on to a bit later on. But, yeah, I mean, there are all these pointers that give us the big... I mean, that's that's in a way why, you know, some of the war photographers like Bob Kappa um, have given us such wonderful images from the Second World War because um, uh, the, the, the phrase, you point the shutter uh, and your picture is bigger than the image you see or your image is bigger than the picture you see. Um, and telling a much much bigger story than just a tractor pulling a, a lump of russian metal away exactly. uh, and you've given us all the you know the nuances and and that's what great photography is all about it doesn't have to be war photography but that's exactly what the tractor um is doing for us because it, it's it as you say david and goliath so when you knock a drone out of the sky with a jar of pickles and it's a 70 year old granny who's doing it and then her husband goes down to the ground floor and tramples on the drone with it and, and destroys it with his spade. It, 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 it's, it's much, much more than that story. It's, it's the young fighting the old. It's, it's the old ways fighting modern technology. I mean, yeah. there's, there's so much in it. And they, that's why we're leaping on these stories. So, you know, it's great to be able to actually analyze what's going on because this was, you know, similar stories would have been happening in the in the Second World War and in the First World War and so on. So, again, not unique. It's absolutely fascinating. Our next question um, is from Dr. Wellington. Um, do you think it is likely that Putin will be removed by his own people, or are they simply too afraid of him to act? Um, <clears throat> I mean, even if they know what's going on at all. On a flip side, could this have happened in Germany in the nineteen forties? Well, I mean, the parallels between Putin and his sycophants and his distance from his own people and Adolf Hitler in the Second World War are, you know, manifest um, and, and endless. Um, uh, and I, I think what brought that around is two years of COVID. So Putin is paranoid about disease and dirt and being poisoned anyway. Way. Um, and for that, we have to thank his uncle yeah, because yeah, his uncle was Stalin's cook. Um, so, you know, he had lessons from his uncle as, as to what life was like in the circle around Joe Stalin. Uh, and some of that has sort of come through to him. And then with his KGB training, 
um, and understanding poisons and all the rest of it, uh, and a personal antipathy towards being sort of poisoned in any way at all. Uh, and then having spent two years in a bubble because of COVID, um, that's just magnified the fears he had anyway. I mean, he's the only Russian leader, uh, he's the only Western leader or world leader who has a food taster. And at all the summits, you know, for the last 20 years, when he's there with Merkel and whoever the American president is, and even the Chinese, he's, he's the only person who has, you know, little, little whatever his name is, Ivan behind him, who, who sips his drink and then says, OK, boss, you can drink it. Look, I'm fine. Um, you know, clearly this is this is a rising market because Obramovich is now going to be cornering the market in food tasters. But uh, it, it, it underlines the point that uh, old Vlad lives in a bubble, has done for several years now, and is so distant, even from his own advisors, never mind the Russian people, that he doesn't really know what's going on. Um, and yes, there must be a the, the Kremlin must be full of corridor, lots of whispered conversations in corners of corridors, just like you know the Wilhelm Strasse was in the 1940s. Um, and there'll be lots of this going on. But I mean, Putin is not stupid. He's read his history, so he knows there'll be plenty of people who are gunning for him, who are looking for an opportunity. Um, and you know, in a way, he's anticipated all of this. Maybe this is what he thought would happen. Maybe he's had a long game that he's been playing for a long, long time because he controls everyone in uniform in Russia, everyone with a weapon, not just the army, but um, all the secret police. Um, it was David Petraeus, the American general, who, who pointed out in an interview not so long ago that Putin has more people under arms in uniform inside the country controlling the population in terms of riot police and secret police than he does in the Russian armed forces, which tells you how suspicious he is of his own people and how he's sure wow. that one day they'll be out to get him. Yeah. So there is an inevitability that there will be some kind of um, coup, but uh, I don't think it'll happen. I don't think it'll succeed because he's got so many people all over that, but he's expecting that, uh, you know, and that that's, you know, Navalny is the thin end of the wedge, if you like. Um, yeah. So th th there is a lot of that. Uh, and therefore, those are all the parallels we, we, we see to Germany uh, in, in, in the 1940s. So um, watch out for Operation Valkyrie. Um, someone is plotting something like that, whether they're oligarchs, whether they're generals. Um, we may never know about it, but that doesn't mean it won't be happening. There will certainly be treasonous conversations going on now amongst the Russians. Um, there are a lot of ordinary Russians. Our, our quarrel isn't with the Russian people. It's with their, their leadership. Yeah. Um, there will be lots of ordinary Russians yeah. now who don't know what's going on or are closing their eyes to it. They just don't want to get involved. Um, and Putin is trying to push them into being super patriots. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, there'll be a lot who, who, who just don't want a part of it at all. Um, so that's that's the world we live in. Just think Gestapo, think White <coughs> Rose, think Germany in 1944, 45. There's a Count Stauffenberg in, somewhere in Russia at the moment as we speak, chatting to his mates. Um, but what what will happen? We will have to to we will have to wait and see how that plays out. Yeah. Um. Let's go to our next question, which is from Aidan O'Sullivan, who asks, I watched the TV series Chernobyl and was shocked at the Soviet culture of corruption, leading to an inability to speak truth to power. Are we seeing anything similar today? I think that follows, kind of follows from where we just got to, actually, doesn't it? <coughs> yes, I mean, the Russian society is, is a kleptocracy rather than a, an autocracy. So it's made up of sort of thieves and, and bandits, if you like. Uh, with Putin at the top, um, because he's enabled them all to gain huge amounts of money, but he controls the power. Um, so again, I mean, something I picked up probably from um, a Phil O'Brien posting was that that the you know, in terms of logistics, you know, one reason why the tires have have all expired on Russian vehicles is because they haven't been replaced. Or if they have been replaced, they bought cheaper Chinese ones rather than the you know the Russian all-terrain, all-weather version with which their their logistics vehicles were meant to be equipped. Um, 
you know, there's clearly quite a bit of the procurement budget that has not gone into buying kit and has gone into people's back pockets because that's been the Russian way for the last 20 years. And it's gone right through to the Russian armed forces. Uh, and some of their poor performance is associated with that kind of th theft uh, of, of money or even yeah. of resources. Um, you know, the fuel shortages won't just be the Ukrainians shooting them uh, you know, like convoys in the Falez pocket. Um, there'll be a lot of diesel that's gone elsewhere into oligarchs, limousines um, uh, and under fuel tanks rather than into the Russian armed forces. Um, and, you know, if their morale is poor because their rations are bad, then that's because someone has been skimping on, on buying proper rations. Um, so that yeah. all feeds into this sort of great big society that is built on theft um, and um, illegality and false accounting. Um, and if you if you read or followed any of the sort of Alexei Navalny's uh, documentaries, he just showed you the tip of the iceberg in terms of the civil society. What we didn't realize, and it, I didn't really think about it, was the same has been happening all the way through the Russian military. Um, mm. And they've probably been selling helicopters um, and, and weaponry, never mind, um, you know, other items as well. So that, that I, I think there's a direct correlation between their poor performance um, and the nature of the regime that Putin represents and is head of. Um, is this perhaps why um, Western apprehension of what the Russians are capable of has been so diff so uh, you know it seems to be quite wide of the mark um, that you know because the joke doing the rounds isn't it is that the Russians had the second best army in the world now it turns out they've got the second best army in Ukraine that 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 <laughs> we you know the Russians have been highly rated for a long time haven't they by by defence analysts and uh, and the defence an analysing industry. And have they got that wrong? Because they, we didn't know this about, as you say, we didn't we knew this about Russian civil society, but not about the, the military end of things. And, you know, Shoigu living in his great big mansion and all that sort of stuff. How come we didn't know? How come? Because uh, obviously the Russians don't know either. It's the, it's the or, or appear not to know the limitations of their, their forces too. What, what's gone on there, do you think? Well, I mean, your dad, the colonel, uh, and I, and you know, yeah. a lot of my gener our generation were all brought up to fear this great big sort of huge monolithic Russian military force um, or Soviet military force um, in, in the days yeah. of the Cold War. So point one is a hangover from that. Um, it, it's yeah. difficult to shift that if that's what you've been taught for sort of 10 or, or, or 20 years. Um, the second point is, I did have a quick look at the Russian armed forces during the era of Glasnost. Um, they came to us, they came to the Defence Academy, they came to various UK military institutions, and some of us went back over there. Um, and we saw what they were being taught, and we saw how old-fashioned it was. But we also saw a young generation our age who wanted to move on. Um, and that was the only window of opportunity we had. So when that closed pretty soon after Putin came to power, so around about 2000, 2001, our understanding of what, what the Russians were and where they were going completely closed off again, just as it had been um, in the Warsaw Pact days. So we've had to make assumptions. Uh, and I think we rather assumed that they were improving in the way that we suggested and we, th we thought might have started to happen under Glasnost. And of course, what has happened mm. is they haven't done that they've gone back to the old ways so this is largely ignorance and it's it, it's very difficult to sort of put in any kind of checks and balances <coughs> whenever we've seen them operate um a close hand in kosovo you know they weren't fighting a war they were just there uh, and they sent their best people and they were on their best behavior um and rather naughty they were too as well taking pristina airport um uh in afghanistan they were fighting you know a counterinsurgency war. This is a completely different, high intensity, high tempo, uh, peer versus peer major clash in Ukraine. It's not like um, Afghanistan at all. So all the tactics, all the checks and balances, all the measures we had about the Russians and our brief glimpses of them when we had have, give, have pointed us in, in the wrong direction. So yeah, we made assumptions about their power, um, their scale, their training, their motivation. 
and they all appear to be um, completely wrong. And I think you know that's that's a um, a huge uh, validation. Uh, well, for a start, it, it 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 shoots down a lot of our previous intelligence assumptions and the and their authors. Um, there are a lot of um, private defence contractors who write consultancy papers who will have all come to the same conclusion. Um, who must be wondering whether their contracts are going to be renewed. Um, it will give us pause for thought, not just about the Russians in the future, but what we know about the Chinese, because we really don't know enough. And at the moment you start drawing assumptions and then you reinforce those assumptions, um, you know, we've, we've now got a huge moment to say, breathe a sigh of relief and realise the Russians weren't anything like as dangerous uh, as we thought they were. Um, but now that's going to make us really pause for thought uh, and, and ponder the Chinese because, you know, we have that same lack of um, transparency uh, uh, about them. But, yeah, I mean, this is a – that one event of invading Ukraine on the 24th of February has changed the world in a way that not even 9-11 did. Um, there won't be an army in the world that won't react to this and change its weaponry um, its manpower requirements, its logistics balances, its its it, it, its equipment. Um, there won't be a university department that won't have to overhaul its international relations um, uh, department. I mean, there'll be new new university departments being set up as a result of this, because of the way that Vladimir Putin has completely shaken the tree that we've built since the Second World War in our understanding of geopolitics and international relations, um, ripped it up to shreds uh, and taken us back 70 yeah. years to where we were in the late 40s and early 1950s. And we thought those mm. days had gone completely forever and they're back. And it just shows you, you know, there's the, the residue of people like that who are still around and we've got to learn how to deal with them all over again because there's no one in power now um, of that generation who has that personal hands-on experience. Um, so all these, you know, this is why the, the world is turned upside down so completely. I mean, there's going to be whole libraries written about what's just happened in the last month and however long it goes on for, yeah. because this is absolutely fundamental. And at the moment, we are, if you think of an hourglass that's been turned upside down, we're in the middle of that turning. We don't know where we are, whether we're up or we're down. We're in the sand that's all been jumbled around because that, that's the nature of this campaign. It's so fundamental. It came such a, such a, a, as a bolt from the blue. Um, and it was the summation of all our worst fears. And one reason why I've been talking about this and writing about this and posting about this so much is because... I've been teaching this since 2012. I was one of the guys who looked at the, the glass and said it was half uh, half uh, full of, of Putin's ill doing. Um, and, you know, not a lot of people were inclined to believe me or join the dots up in my particular way. So I, I'm the time scale I hadn't quite anticipated, but there's nothing here that surprises me. Um, uh, you know, the gratifying thing is now I've got so many students from the Defence Academy who, who are sending me emails saying, God, you know, you were right. I didn't believe you, but. So that's why I'm all over this. Um, and I'm <laughs> reacting in the way I am. Um, <clears throat> our next question is from Bob Benson. Um, uh, and Bob asks, for the past decade, or says, Vladimir Putin's close friends and allies have infiltrated the economies and governments of European countries as a soft power grab. Did the Nazis attempt this in the lead up to 1939? Oh, that's a very good question. So, um, I mean, it's easy now with hindsight well, to Ed say... Well, uh, Edward VIII. <coughs> <laughs> Edward VIII. Yeah, very, 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 very <coughs> Cough. <laughs> I, it's, I mean, there are two aspects to this. One, one is actually the Chinese bubble burst in exactly the same way just before the Russian one did. We suddenly realized the Chinese were in every academic department and feeding secrets and know-how back to, to Beijing um, and the, the 
Americans got very, very upset about that very quickly. And that spread to the United Kingdom uh, and around Europe. Uh, and the Chinese started to be to be ostracized. At the same time, we suddenly realized we didn't want them building our power station and all our energy security being reliant on Chinese know-how. So we managed just in the nick of time, I think, to identify that as a problem. But the other problem, the other elephant in the room was the Russians were doing exactly the same. And it took until 20, the 24th of February for us to actually acknowledge that. And still, there are lots of politicians in this country and certainly around Europe with their head in their sand, in the sand, wishing this problem would go away. This is all terribly inconvenient, mm. and we'd really like the Russians to somehow come to their senses so we can go back to the old world. And it, it, I'm afraid it's going to be another month or however long it takes for some of these people to realise that the world has turned that abrupt corner I was saying, uh, I was talking about just a few minutes ago. We're never going to go back to where we were in early the world has changed so fundamentally, and what's frightening is we don't know where it's going to take us. So that's the point there. So how, how does this relate to Germany in the 1930s? I don't think they were seeding people in other countries. What they were doing was seeding their own population. Um, you know, the vast majority of, of, uh, of Germans didn't vote for the Nazi party uh, in the various elections. So how did the Germans come to power? The not the, how did the Nazis come to power? They had an active campaign of courting uh, industrialists and the middle classes, um, and and those were people with money and power and influence. So the Germans never had the popular vote, um, you know, until the the last election, if you like. But what they did do, and that was a very clear policy was target the people of influence within their own country because the German, the Nazis were a tiny minority really of ill-bred thugs from the lower classes. And how on earth were they going to appeal to, to, to wider Germany? Um, and it so they they said everything to everybody. <coughs> I mean, the, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSDAP, is not one party. It's a multitude of different parties. And it's not the just the Workers' Party or the, the Socialist Party. It, it, it's They courted the Greens. Um, so Walter Dare, who was in charge of, um, you know, all, all the sort of green issues of, of you know, soil and, and um, uh, doing away with fertilizer. I mean, all the sort of issues that we're familiar with and we, 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 we back today were considered very, very unusual in 1920s, 1930s Germany. But the Green, um, I mean, nothing to do with the modern Green Party, but his, uh, but he commanded five members of parliament. So Hitler cozied it up to him and sold him all sorts of ideas about back to the land um, and, you know, Wagnerian nonsense. And so he got into bed with the Nazis. And that's how they built up a majority of deputies in the Reichstag. These weren't Nazis. These were people from a lot of little parties who the Nazis cornered and sold them whatever they wanted, told them what they wanted to hear. And that's how they bought up, built up support within the Reichstag. At the same time, they were courting interest groups. The industrialists are one, people like um, uh, Alfred Krupp. But they also did go overseas to people like um, Henry Ford. Um, but at the same time, they courted the, the German army, who were a society amongst themselves who didn't even vote German arms, German officers were not allowed to vote. I mean, they were so apart from society. They were the complete separate organization of, of their own. But again, the Nazis cozied up to them. Uh, and when the uh, the German, when Hitler realized how unpopular the SA were Ernst Röhm stormtroopers, he did that deal with the Nazi, with the German army, who supplied weapons to the SS. Uh, and then you have the <coughs> Night of the Long Knives. So I would say that you know what the Russians are do were doing and the Chinese were doing today in terms of building up influence elsewhere, the Germans were doing, but they were doing it internally within their own society. So there are parallels, but they're not quite exact in the same in the way that we we might think. I mean, one of the things that's worth pointing out, of course, is you know two weeks ago we had all the all the scandal of you know Johnson's Boris Johnson's connections to. Russian money and all the sort of schmoozing he'd done. 
it's it they didn't get very good value for money in you know in terms of uh, the Russians didn't in, in terms of the sheer number of end laws that the that, 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 or javelins or whatever that the British the, the British government has sent to Ukraine and Operation Orbital was running at the same time. It seems that one of the things for all this talk of Russian soft power, it's turned out turned out it's not really been worth much because the invasion has galvanized Western governments in a way clearly Putin did not estimate could happen. You know, people saying, oh, Brexit, Brexit for instance, has weakened European cohesion. Well, certainly Putin thought so, but it, but it, but I don't know that it. I, I, don't, or I don't know that it has to the extent that that people who don't like Brexit kind of wish it had in a in a strange way. Because after all, one of the things that happens okay, so, in a major political event like right. this is people so, so, project their concerns onto it, don't they? Yeah. So I mean, let me draw a parallel. So I think you know, but there is something wrong with Vladimir Putin um, to to put not too fine a point on it. Um, I mean, why did yeah. he invade Ukraine in February when the weather is at its worst yeah. and its muddiest? You know, the ghosts of Napoleon and Hitler would have been tapping him on his shoulder and saying, you know, come on, mate, wait till May when the weather is better. Um, so he didn't go before February the 24th because he didn't want to annoy the Chinese because the Olymp Winter Olympics had to finish. So um, that's that, that's why it wasn't any earlier. But why, why, why then? Um, had he waited a, a bit later on in the year, then Nord Stream 2, you know, one of the main triggers of angst across Europe, this gas pipeline, um, which had been completed but not certified by the Germans. Had he waited a few more months, the Germans would have certified that. The gas would have started to, to flow into Europe, 43% of Europe's gas and natural gas needs. And his economic lever on Europe would have been much, much higher than it is at the moment. Yeah. Um, there yeah. are, I think, 12 European countries who are going to the polls this year. He could have waited to um, interfere with the elections and at least muddy the waters and distract people's attention away from what he was doing to their own domestic poli um, political concerns. So there are lots of reasons why he should have waited much, much later in, in the year. He could have waited till uh, 2024, with all the speculation about a, a second Trump presidency. So why now? Yeah. And that's the big mystery, because we don't know. But it makes no sense that he went at the time he did on the basis of the knowledge that we <coughs> have. And he, I think, in some ways, is, you know, the Russians own our secret weapon in, in the Russian Federation, just like Adolf Hitler was um, for the Allies in the Second World War. Here's a man who's making bad decisions and he's digging a hole and he's making it worse. Um, he's throwing the Russian army into more of the Russian army into Ukraine. He's not accepting uh, any co compromise. Uh, he, he, he wants to see the death of Ukraine. It's very difficult to see how he's got any kind of exit strategy uh, and he's, he's making it worse, not better. Um, so I think, you know, the, 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 the sum of that that's going on here, uh, and, and that's the parallel. But the big mystery um, is is why now? And, I you know, that goes back to where we started, which is demographics. That may be one of the reasons this is the last Russian generation he's got to be able to send into battle because if the Russians are breeding fewer children and they're dying younger, you've got that diminishing pool of manpower you can put into uniform. That's point one. My own suspicion is he's probably got a medical time bomb that he no one knows about. Uh, and in a year or two, he won't be with us anyway. So this is one moment to produce his masterstroke. Mm -hmm. It's like Tommy Shelby. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Steve Brown at Gale has, uh, I think we've pretty got, we've pretty got time for one more. Um, uh, and that's from Steve. Are the Peter? Are the Ukrainians capable militarily to launch offensives to push Russia back, or is it a defensive war for them? Well, they've come a long way in a month, uh, and on day one, they would have thought, "I wonder if we can hold on for a week." They had nothing to lose, so of course they would fight back. And this is their homeland. Um, four weeks later. They are amazed at their own performance, as is, you know, Vladimir Zelensky. Um, and we admire them all enormously. And he's become the Churchill of his age, the Churchill of his, his nation. 
Um, I don't think at the moment they are capable or even thinking of going over to the offensive. What they have done is learned how to deal with the Russians. They are investing in local attacks to nibble away at their um, opponents. What they are doing is trying to preserve as much of their combat power as possible. Um, and that means local attacks on small scale, often fought at night, um, prepared with huge amounts of intelligence from which they've got the benefit of you know, Western satellite feeds uh, and uh, a lot of drone activity beforehand. Um, and they are nibbling away. Now, locally, if you're a Russian, you might interpret that as a counteroffensive. If you're a Ukrainian in a battalion, and your battalion goes over the top and does rather well against a local Russian unit, that to you may be a counteroffensive. But in the way we are looking at things in the West and the way we understand these things in the bigger wheels of history, um, no, but I don't think they want to do that because that would, that would be a huge strategic risk for them. Um, and they, it's a risk they don't need to take. They're holding the Russians in check at the moment. Um, they're doing extremely well. But what we have to forget is there's a big battle going on in the whole Donbass region uh, further east. And there, most of the professional Ukrainian army is based with all their equipment. And what they've managed to do is hold most of the Russian forces, including those down at Mariupol, um, in check. But they're slowly losing combat power. Um, and uh, when Mariupol falls, all the forces that are in there will be released what's left of them uh, and, and the fear is actually they, they may be enough to overwhelm the, the ukrainians who are left fighting in the donbass well they will then have to withdraw quite quickly back to the river Dnieper, um and that's a challenge because they will have to cross it very quickly and that could completely alter the balance of power so they're in no state, but they're in no mind to want to go over to the uh, uh, to the offensive, because that's not going to help them at all. They don't have the combat power to take on the Russian forces in Ukraine and win. Um, but what they can do is demoralize the Russians far more effectively by nibbling away, by attacking every night, by hitting their logistics convoys, by blowing up railways, uh, and all of that sort of thing. That's going to be the way they defeat the Russians and push them out by completely demoralizing them. And that's one point we haven't really talked about and we don't see much mention of because we get fascinated by long columns of Russian tanks burning or uh, trucks that have been immobilized. The role of railways. Um, and there are hugely important railway lines that, that um, move mostly east-west through Ukraine. Um, and they are the lifeblood of, of supply for the Ukrainians, but the logistics hubs for the Russians. And we forget this. Uh, and a lot of the Russian uh, thrusts and attacks have been from railheads or to get to other railheads. And what the Russians have been doing le and leaning very, very heavily on it is rail transport. Now, the Ukrainians haven't been attacking it because that's that's the they want those same facilities in, in the future. Um, yeah. Uh, and so the railways have been left largely intact, which is unusual. Um, but both sides have been using them. Uh, and, and of course, the, the drone footage doesn't show as much about railways. It's shown as one armoured train, which is absolutely fascinating, and another throwback to the, the 1940s. But just as in the First World War, you know, that's how you get huge numbers of people from A to B as quick as possible. Uh, and this is what Deutsches Reichsbahn were doing all the way through the Second World War. Railways are absolutely key, and they've had a completely understated role um, in, in this campaign so far. Um, and, you know, the Ukrainians haven't been attacking them, because if they were in, suddenly find themselves in a position of chasing the Russians out of Ukraine, they'd need that, because that would be, that would bring all legit, the logistics forward very very quickly but vice versa if the ukrainians suddenly collapse and the russians are moving forward then the only way and we've seen it from all the you know columns of vehicles immobilized the only way you can get a lot of stuff forward very very quickly is by using the railways so i i can see why you know we would love the ukrainians to go on to the, the counter offensive 
Um, but I would venture that's simply not going to happen for all sorts of, uh, of reasons. It, it's too risky um, for them. They can have a, as big a defeat of the Russians just doing what they're doing. Um, and, you know, there's no Russian who wants to be out of his armoured vehicle or off the roads at night because that's when you're going to get slotted. Um, and that's why they're sort of congregating. Um, together and even abandoning vehicles because they feel the safety in numbers. Gosh, it's all so fascinating, isn't it? And, it really and, is. and horrible. Um, uh, uh, well, um, uh, well, thank you, Peter. Thanks for, for joining us this evening from your from the um, Schloss. My Croatian lair. In, uh, your Croatian lair. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, uh, there's so much to digest. I mean, I think, <clears throat> you know, to come right back to where we where we started, I think, the, you know, the, the, the thing, the thing to, that, that as p people interested in the Second World War, we can take from this is the fact that when the events are happening, no one has the faintest idea what's going on. Yeah. And, you, you know, I can uh, you can relate to the confusion in May 1940, where the French army think that. Um, you know that th 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 they don't need to man the MERS properly because they think it's coming from somewhere else, and they've they've believed their own doctrine, they've believed their own assessment of the other side, and they make a terrible mistake. Yet at the time, that's not clear and apparent, and certainly not running up the running up the food chain decision wise, is it? And I think that's the thing you can see happening here in real time, as much as we can tell anything else, is that in that sense, war, what wars work in the work in the same way no matter how many drones there are now or electronic countermeasures or you know uh, uh, boffins in uh, in tweet farms generating cyber war or whatever that 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 confusion that stuff and also the fact that no plan survives contact with the enemy um is the stuff that remains eternally true would, would you say yeah, I mean, if we go back to 1940, and I think that's a very good parallel. Um, I mean, we, we had no understanding of what was going on. I mean, the Blitzkrieg comes from nowhere, and there's no granularity, is the modern phrase, of, of what's happening where yeah. or to whom. And today we've got the opposite. We've got endless social media footage, dash cam footage, body cam footage, satellite imagery, you name it, it's there. And in a way, actually that gives us the same result because we've got too much information. Yeah. And if you've got too yeah. much information swarming and swamping you, that's pretty much the same as having no information because you can't decipher it. Uh, and the worry is, as I said earlier, if you, if you look at it selectively and make it tell you what you want to see, you're going to end, you could end up with a catastrophic result. Um, yeah. And you know, what we're seeing is is the result of some very careful release of footage. I mean, these you know every every image we see that's posted by a Ukrainian soldier isn't old. You know, um, Igor who's just taken out his phone, yeah. had a quick you know few seconds of 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 whatever's going on, and then he's posted it onto the web. I mean, every single soldier in that campaign on the Ukrainian side is being monitored by his officers as to what he's releasing when his phone is on when it's off because every time you know the old mobile is on that's a, a gps signal that the russians can lock onto so the footage we're seeing is not as spontaneous as we are led to believe it's all being released mm. to an end which is to show how good the ukrainians are and they're brilliant uh, and this is not knocking them but we just have to be careful. So I, th I, you know, I go back to that point. Too little information, too much information. We're probably in the same place. So we have this rich yeah. panoply of, of pictures of tractors towing tanks around, endless pictures of, of Russian tanks being blown up. Um, have you seen any combat footage of Ukrainian losses in the <laughs> same way, except from Russian no. television? No, so I mean we don't yeah, know it, it, we don't know even the, what the Ukrainian losses are, do we? That they're, they're not making them public, as far as I could tell, and so we we don't know. Do so we? They, so you know the Ukrainian government gives a, a press release every day of how many Russian things they've destroyed or Russian soldiers they've killed or captured, uh, and all the cumulative totals, uh, and and they're great. But 
because it's coming from Kiev, we have to be careful. Um, so, you know, the Pentagon and the, uh, the, the the UK Ministry of Defense write them down a bit. So it's, it's still, you know, substantial. Um, but um, they release no figures about their own casualties. Uh, and clearly, we can't trust the Russians. Well, what have the Russians said so far? They've lost 1,500 people killed and 3,500 wounded. Um, now, you know, we could be charitable and but say that the Russian, assistant... There was, some Russian, there was a Russian thing the other day that, that or Russian-related agency, which... Oh, yes, yeah, 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 who put up a Russian newspaper who put up a, a casualty list of 13,000 people killed. It was taken down, you know, shortly off. I think that was a Ukrainian hack. I, I think those are real figures, and they found them somewhere in the Russian Ministry of Defence, put them up, um, and there was a lot of red faces and stamping around and probably 9 millimeter headaches um, or lead poisoning of the 9 millimeter kind, uh, and then the, the, the numbers yeah. were taken down. So, I mean, essentially, those Russian figures, I think, are, are a zero missing. Um, but it underlines the point. You've just got to be careful. I mean, let, let's go back to, um, I don't know, 8th American Air Force uh, uh, kills of the Luftwaffe in 1943, 1944. And they're shooting down more Messerschmitt 109s and Focke-Wulf 190s than the Luftwaffe have. So you have to halve their, their claims. <laughs> and those are the good guys on our side. So, you know, part of that is fog of war and part of that is, you know, morale boosting and everything else. And that's where we are, because we're in the middle. We know where our sympathies lie. Um, but, you know, we have to be we have to put in, you know, as, as military historians and military enthusiasts and people who read books, we need to exercise a bit of caution and say, you know, the real figures are sort of somewhere in the middle. Um, but we are only getting, you know, limited sides of the picture. So, you know, the big nasty shock around the corner of the Russians doing something that we really hadn't expected that is really, really detrimental. Well, that came on the 24th of February. We haven't had another of those recently. Um, and I can't believe the Russians are just going to quietly simmer down and, and, and shuffle off without some nasty sting in the tail. Yeah, And I'm not talking chemical or yeah. biological or, or, or nuclear warfare or anything else like that. I mean, my message there is calm down. Um, if they were going to do that, they'd have brought NBC suits. They'd have bought NBC warning and reporting vehicles. Um, uh, and, and nobody's been issued with any of that kit. None of the stuff has even gone out on exercise. So that is not on the cards. But, but you know, the Russians will be cooking up something, and we've just got to be prepared for setbacks. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Peter. Um, uh Everyone on the sidebar and on and on Twitter simultaneously saying um, how interesting and stimulating this has been, and uh, I mean, <clears throat> sobering too. I th sixty people, I think, at one point. Yeah, 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 and sobering too. I mean, uh, you know, we sometimes have a laugh on a Monday, but I think we're we're, we're we've you know uh, ended up. In a more serious place, inevitably, thanks to thanks to Mr. Bloody Putin. Um, uh, thanks again. Um, well, I'm sure at some point, maybe you know, depending on how long this goes on, we'll have you back on for for uh, to pick your brains again, Peter. If that if if you're interested, although you're a busy man at the moment. Well, I mean, okay. So, I mean, it's been really interesting for me. Um, just sort of collecting my thoughts like this. Um, and I know there are people out there who are sort of saying, "Oh, well." You the war historians are glorifying this. They're, they're wallowing in it. I mean, we're, we're really not. We're trying to make sense of, of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, which is really difficult. We're feeling guilty um, at overestimating the Russian strength, strength and size and power. And I'm feeling really guilty at not having given Ukraine much of a hope when Russians invaded. And a month later, they're still doing remarkably well. So, I mean, we all get these things wrong. It's how quickly you learn, how quickly you recover um, uh, 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 and make sense. So that's why I'm you know, in the business of doing this. And for me, military history, uh, and this is what Richard Hoban has always told me, you know, it, it, it's not just collecting tanks or making model aircraft or reading books for its own sake. It has a utility as well. And the utility is, is making sense of this exactly this kind of thing. 
um, the unpleasantness that's going on uh, at the moment. Because we, we can't know the future. We have no road signs um, for, for, for the future. All we can do is look at the past and say, on the basis of what's gone before, and whether it's five years earlier or 55 years earlier, this could be what's around the corner. And that's why I'm, I'm in the profession I am. That's why I do what I do, because I think it's it's not just history for its own sake. It serves a purpose. Uh, and, you know, at the moment, that purpose, I think, saves lives. It, it, it can, you know, it can help other governments survive. It can help free countries survive. Uh, and that's why, you know, what we do and, and the way we look at military history, I think, is just so valuable. And everybody out there plays a role in that. Well, well obviously, I completely agree. Um, and um, as I said, it's 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 like Dr. Crick's analog approach to weather forecasting. It's the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank uh, Spot on. Excellent. Thanks for inviting me on. Perfect. Thanks for inviting me on. Lessons of war to help you inform the present. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. Um, uh, this will st I think this link stays up. So if you want to recap or look at this again, um, uh, it's staying up enough. We were open to um, strangers this evening. Um, welcome anyone who's come to a We Have Ways live cast for the first time. Um, as Swedex, the Swedex says, it'll all be history one day. We'll see you all soon. Thanks very much for watching. Bye bye. Cheerio. Bye.